You're talking about me as a parent shaping my child's brain forever and ever. That's scary. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it in a less scary format. Okay, let's um, do it. The brain is constantly changing throughout the lifespan. There's always room to grow new circuits as you get older. But a parent has this wonderful opportunity as the first teacher, because all teachers can do this, but when the circuits of kindness and resilience are first growing is in the first three or four years of life. And so my intimate connection with you on a daily basis, you come home from school, before you go to school, you're home as a baby, all these ways that our communication is literally going to shape the circuits of regulation that allow kindness and resilience to develop based on what I do. Mm. Now, it sounds like it's a lot of pressure. It's more like an opportunity. Parents give birth to kids as a privilege that we then share their lives with them, but we can shape the way their brain is growing. And I think what you said in there that makes me less anxious. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I was really nervous. Yeah. <laughs> is that you don't have to get a PhD in shaping a child's brain. You're talking no. about everyday things that we do with a slightly different way of looking at our children and our children's behavior. It, and yeah. that's what we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about as examples of that. But Excellent. that's really what you're talking about. Yeah, and the way Tina, Bryce, and I tried to say that is, you know, the moments that are sometimes most challenging as a parent, where we feel overwhelmed and burdened and confused, are actually the very moments you can see as opportunities to do something that we haven't mentioned, but we can get into it, but it's called integration. You know, and, and so through the work I've done over the last 20 years, it's been to try to define what the mind is, and believe it or not, in the field of psychology and the field of attachment and the field of psychiatry and the field of mental health, the field of education, the field of philosophy even, there is no definition of the mind. There's none. So in the work I do, it's in a field called interpersonal neurobiology, we combine all the sciences together and we offer a definition of the mind. And then it lets parents with that definition realize that the mind is both in relationships and in the body. And by really locating the mind in these two places, it really empowers parents to say, I want my mind of my child, the mind of my child, to be healthy and strong and resilient and kind. Those are mental mm -hmm. functions. So I know I have to use my relationship to actually shape the brain. And then you can learn about these basics of the brain. So these moments that seem the most challenging, instead of perceiving them as a burden, you reframe them and you say, OK, this is a challenging moment. But how do I use, and that's why we did the book, and the book has cartoons and all this kind of stuff. You know, we made it really accessible so parents can make the brain something that they can really understand because to really deeply understand the mind, you really need to understand both the brain and relationships. But you suggest that even children, you, you try to help children understand what's happening in their brain when yeah, things are happening. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we'll, we, we'll have, exactly we have sections in, in the book where, and we already have very young kids, as young as two and a half, as a, our youngest reader, who are actually going over the pictures of the brain because if you think about it, why shouldn't every citizen on this planet know about how their brain works? Because when you know how your brain works, you actually can change the way it works. This is just the truth of it. So, so what we did was we just said, OK, we're having this be about parents know about the child's brain and have the child learn about her own brain, we'll too. We'll go through some examples yeah. of that. You know, the, other, the only other time that we've, in the last few years, talked about parents affecting the brain has been through videos like Baby Einstein, where mm -hmm. it's been about using things to make your child stand out and yeah. learn the alphabet. So is this kind of Baby Einstein for mm. the heart? No. <laughs> First of all, uh, a colleague of mine, I mean, Andrew Meltzoff and Patricia Kuehl did a study of the Baby Einstein tapes, you probably know this, in Seattle. And this is why there was a multi-million law dollar lawsuit against Disney, because they bought Baby Einstein and they showed that if you had your baby doing Baby Einstein tapes, they actually did worse at language acquisition. Now, so A, it doesn't work. So <laughs> A, it doesn't work, and B, your child will actually be less good at what you were hoping mm. and buying the product to make it good and affect what the product said. Now, why was that the case? When we talk to Andy and Pat, what they say is, it isn't that there was something bad about these tapes. 
It's that when parents stick kids in front of a screen, they're taking time away from a relationship. And there are a lot of other studies just to support their point of view that learning happens in relationships. Relationships give you a feeling of trust. Relationships inspire you. Relationships activate a part of the brain that's very much aligned with the motivational circuits, so you feel very motivated. You know, a friend of mine did a study, you know, they say you can't learn a foreign language after adolescence, right? That's generally true. And a friend of mine wrote a whole book, uh, John Schumann, showing that there was a subset of adults who could learn a foreign language in adulthood. And all of them had one thing in common. What? They were in love with someone who spoke that language. <laughs> <laughs> Very motivated. <laughs> And that was the secret. That's the secret. That's the secret. <laughs> you yeah. want to learn French? I'm trying to still learn uh, all sorts of things, but no, that, that's, uh, that's, so, that, so that's the issue. So, yeah. so, the thing, so this is not baby Einstein. In a way, this is the opposite of baby Einstein. This is saying human beings, I, I think you know, in terms of where we're at in our culture, we're at this very funny moment where rigorous science abandoned the mind. Even the field of psychology abandoned the mind, really. Field of psychiatry, my field, abandon the mind. It's just a strange thing. I think we're at a moment of huge change in just bringing the rigor of science into the reality that the mind is not the same as the activity of the brain, no matter what neuroscientists say, and that the mind is both embodied, so the nervous system is really important, but it's not just up in the head. Um, it's throughout the whole body, and it's relational. And that way, if you're interested in culture, or cultural change, whether it's in a school, like a medical school, or a primary school, or any kind of school, or you're interested in cultural change in our society. You see, this title, Building the Neural Circuits for Resilience and Kindness, is absolutely about parenting, but it's equally about our culture. Hmm. It's about the whole field of education. Right? You can just change the first part, and you know, like surviving in the 21st century, or living in the 21st century, or something like that. Because you can make an argument that the future of the human species is dependent on doing these things. It's absolutely dependent on looking at the idea that we can use intentionality to change the pathway of cultural evolution on this planet. And all you have to do is read the newspaper or you know, get on the internet and you see how serious this is. Now the great news is we are incredibly creative creatures. And we can do this. And there's no better place to start than in parenting. 